The views, information, or opinions expressed in this broadcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not represent those of any other persons or entities. Furthermore, some of the activities discussed might be dangerous or illegal. Attempt them at your own risk. Welcome to another edition of The Peculiar World here on the Paranormal UK radio network. I'm your host, Jeff Davis. You might be surprised to learn how long ago people started investigating the paranormal, but not all that surprised as to how things have changed in the last 20 years. They have been affected by increases in technology, television, and social media. Now, most anthropologists would argue that people have believed in the paranormal, that is, in ghosts, monsters, and told myths about them soon after the first caveman looked out into the night, sniffed the air, listened, but could find no rational explanation for the strange sounds he heard in the darkness. But what about people who lacked the common sense to be afraid, and challenged the myths by investigating the unexplained? Who was the first ghost hunter? In Western culture, the author Pliny the Younger, from Rome, recorded a story sometime between 65 and 115 AD about a house in ancient Greece and the man who investigated the haunt. That was over 2,000 years ago. I'm going to ask you how many traditions in this story have passed down from then to now. Let me read you some from a translation and let's see if anything sounds familiar to you. There was in Athens a house, large and spacious, which had a bad reputation, as though it was filled with pestilence. In the dead of night, a noise was frequently heard resembling the clashing of iron, which, if you listen carefully, sounded like the rattling of chains. The noise would seem to be a distance away, but it would start coming closer, and closer, and closer. Immediately after this, a specter would appear in the form of an old man, emaciated and squalid, with bristling hair and a long beard, and rattling the chains on his hands and feet as he moved. The unfortunate inhabitants of the house went sleepless at night due to the unimaginable and dismal terrors. Without sleep, as it happened to others, their health was ruined and they were struck by some kind of a madness. As the horrors in their minds increased, they were led on a path towards death. Because of this, the house was eventually deserted and damned as uninhabitable, abandoned entirely to the ghost. In hope that some tenant might eventually be found who was ignorant of the house's malevolence, a bill was posted for its sale. As it happened, a philosopher by the name of Athenodorus came to Athens at that time. Reading the bill for the house, he easily discovered the price, and being an intelligent man, he was suspicious at its extremely low cost. Someone did tell him the whole story, and yet he wasn't dissuaded, but was instead eager to make the purchase. Thus he did. Athenodorus sent his servants to bed and started working on some writing project. Eventually the sounds got closer until the ghost was standing over Athenodorus, beckoning as the philosopher bent over a scroll. Eventually Athenodorus followed the ghost outside into the courtyard. The ghost stopped and disappeared. Athenodorus marked the spot, and the next day had city officials dig there, and they found human bones still wearing rusting shackles. They collected the bones and gave them a proper burial, and the ghost never appeared again. You might well find the entire article interesting. If you visit my website, ghostsandcritters.com, in the What's New section, I should have some links up by the time this episode airs on the Paranormal UK radio network. Of course, this is from Western European tradition. I'm not sure that across the world there have not been other brave souls who stood up to their fear of the unknown and known and were enlightened even before Athenodorus and Pliny. In the centuries since, until the 20th century, paranormal investigations were documented in writing, in books, pamphlets, and brochures. There were, of course, lectures and societies like the Ghost Club in England who came together to share expertise and investigate. Moving into the 20th century, there were movies, mostly fictionalized, documenting the paranormal. It was really television that spread the word about paranormal investigations, or ghost hunting, 
as most people know it today. In 1959, ABC Television debuted a show called One Step Beyond, which ran over 96 episodes until 1961. The producers claimed that each episode was based on the true stories and actual experiences of real people. There were episodes on haunted houses, as well as famous locations and events, such as the San Francisco earthquake and the Titanic. In 1976, Alan Landsberg produced a show called In Search Of, hosted by Leonard Nimoy. The show ran from 76 until 1982 and was rebooted in 2002 and again in 2018 has been restarted and this time Zachary Quinto so we've got the old Spock being replaced by the new Spock now this series ran the gamut from ghosts to UFOs to ancient mysteries to conspiracy theories of all kinds the next big show in this genre was Unsolved Mysteries which aired on NBC from 1987 off and on into 2010 and is being reissued as I speak this was perhaps the most famous show of the paranormal true crime genre treating the paranormal in a serious way in those days there was a set formula for success on all these shows there was a trustworthy host who gave you an intro about the episode setting the stage so to speak then there was a reenactment of the events mixed in with talking headshot interviews from the witnesses this ended with a summary by the host in those days, most people who were curious about investigating the paranormal learned how to, mostly by reading books on the subject. That, of course, changed with the beginning of the new millennia. In 2002, the English television show Most Haunted aired. In 2004, the American television show Ghost Hunters aired. Both of these shows consistently had hosts visiting haunted locations and performing their own paranormal investigations, coming up with facts behind the legend, paranormal evidence, etc., and sometimes not. The important thing is that they brought the subject matter of the paranormal out as a mainstream subject for conversation speculation. I don't know how many of these reality TV shows are airing currently. That's too hard to track right now. I don't have cable. My guest may actually know. He has survived and thrived as a paranormal investigator. It's my friend Ross Allison. Let me tell you a little more about him. This is from one of his websites. Ross Allison, professional ghost hunter, paranormal investigator, author, media host, lecturer, teacher, and even tour guide. The Pacific Northwest's only full-time ghost hunter. Ross is the founder of A-Ghost, the advanced ghost hunters of Seattle, Tacoma, and now runs A-Ghost Investigation. With well over 20 years of investigating the paranormal and over 10 years of running a ghost hunting group, Ross travels internationally to investigate paranormal activity, collect ghost stories, research cemeteries, and teach other things about the strange goings-on all around us. Ross has been lecturing for power performers since 2004 and has spoken to thousands of students at hundreds of colleges and universities throughout the U.S. on his ghost hunting adventures, and he teaches a class based on his book, Ghostology 101, Becoming a Ghost Hunter, at the University of Washington and Tacoma Community College. His lectures have also taken him to such faraway locations as London, Canada, and Scotland. Through his travels, he has had opportunities to work with some of the biggest names in the field, such as Jason and Grant of Ghost Hunters fame. He has also investigated some of the scariest and most haunted sites known to man. For instance, the Stanley Hotel, Eastern State Prison, Amityville House, Alcatraz Prison, and the Roman Catacombs, and the Ancient Rams Inn in England, and even the original House for the Exorcist, where he captured some of the scariest phenomena he has ever encountered. Ross also has a few more books through Clarice Press, including Spooked in Seattle, Haunted Washington, and The Ghost Hunter's Journal. Soon to follow is Ghost on Campus, which features many of the campuses he has investigated on his lecture tours. He appeared on a number of radio programs in magazines, books, news coverage, and television shows, including The Learning Channel's America's Ghost Hunters, The Tonight Show, MTV, CMT is quite an alphabet, CNN, A&E, The Discovery Channel, ABC's Scariest Places on Earth, Sci-Fi's Ghost Hunters, Nightline, and two episodes of Travel Channel's Most Terrifying Places in America. You may also find Ross wandering the streets of Seattle where he hosts the Spooked in Seattle Ghost Tours that take guests to the various haunted spots throughout the Seattle area. Some of his personal projects are the Angry Ghost Hunter blog, and he is kind of angry at times, and the series Unknown Truth, which has been picked up by the Ghost Channel and other media networks nationwide. Well, Ross, this is kind of an older biography. Did I miss anything? <laughs> well, it definitely needs to be updated quite a bit. Well, yeah, my books have changed quite a bit now. You know, since I work now for Leprechaun Press, I actually got a few other titles that I work with, uh, David Weatherly, since we started doing the Haunted series. So my latest book now is Haunted Ships and Lighthouses. 
for the Haunted series. Previous one was Haunted Toys. So I'm up to six books published and two more coming out this year. So, yeah, I need to update that quite a bit. Busy, busy, busy. Yeah, and then plus, you know, we were both featured on Ghost Adventures, so that, that should be credited there, too. Yeah, it, it's kind of an interesting life, as I hate to admit this. Of course, you are, to the best of my knowledge, the only one who does this full-time. I am merely trying. <laughs> oh, it's a lot of hard work, paycheck to paycheck, pretty much. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't give it up. I, I love doing what I do. I love the traveling. I love the, the research and the lecturing. And I just love to have these opportunities to help educate people as to what's going on in the world of paranormal research. Because I find, you know, now that paranormals become very popular, the the waters have gotten very muddy now. You know, there's a lot of groups out there. You know, I'm sure you can account for when I started Ghosts, we were probably one out of 100 groups nationally. And now each state could easily have 100 plus groups. So that's how crazy it is in in the paranormal world. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And since you mentioned ghost hunter groups and to use the college word proliferation of some of these groups, it's it's interesting. What I found is that a lot of times one of these groups will form and they will be co-workers or something like that. There will be somebody who's interested in the paranormal. They will get their co-workers or families involved and then they will work pretty well for a couple of years and then they have creative differences just like on the tv shows oh yeah oh yeah and and the the fact of the matter is a lot of these groups start up for all the wrong reasons you know whether it's just for thrill seek because they see all this stuff on television and think it's going to be exactly like that and of course they die of boredom because not always like that it's a lot of sitting around the dark waiting for something to happen but then you know too it's some of these groups you know get uh started because they hope to have their own television show as well so it's it's we're kind of losing touch of the reality when it comes to ghost hunting i know me and David were were talking about it, David Weatherly, when I say David, um, you know, just how much it's changed ghost hunting in the last 50 years or even less than that, 20 years. It's changed quite a bit. It seems like, you know, most people don't even want to do the real work involved in ghost hunting. They don't want to, you know, record for four hours and then have to go back and listen and watch, you know, those four hours of recording. They want to simplify ghost hunting. They want the instant results. So there's a lot of unfortunate bad devices out there that give them that satisfaction and I'm, I'm hoping to open people's minds to the idea of what's good and bad in the field as well yeah that's very true you and I uh, have been doing this for actually over 20 years both of us now and I have found that yeah people people try and act scientifically when they're investigating but all too often what really happens is they equate being a scientific investigator with having some kind of electronic gizmo and getting results for what they right. think are results, which doesn't actually mean they're really getting the ghost. Right, and the shows are very misleading when it comes to that, you know, especially when it comes to the basic EMF detectors. A lot of people, when they run out there and buy an EMF detector, they don't really understand EMF and how it works and, and how easily you can, you know, take a, a natural EMF reading and make it proof to the paranormal. Yeah. Uh, see a lot of that on the television shows you know where they'll get an interesting reading the emf detector will start blinking and they're like oh my god it's going off but yet they don't try to find a source so what could be causing the emf you know is it coming from the floor is it coming from the ceiling the walls or anything like that they just stand there looking at the blinking light and they start freaking out it happens a lot boy you sound passionate about that one (laughs) (laughs) yes i agree with you absolutely you remember when we were first starting out digital cameras good digital cameras were super expensive and almost nobody had one uh, yeah i think my first digital camera was like 300 bucks and it was like two megapixels you're lucky to have that my <laughs> first digital camera was 300 dollars. i got it in 1997 uh, 1998 it was a um 640 by 480 pixels total resolution. Well, Believe that or so not. It's it's interesting, you know, how much it's come and technology has advanced so much just in that short amount of time, too. It's just like, God, I, I look at some of the equipment that 
I was going through our, our lab and, you know, and I'm, I've still I've become kind of a hoarder because I, I don't want to get rid of the old stuff either. Going back to film and, and, and the cassette tapes, you know, no one uses those anymore in ghost hunting. And I'm just, but wait a minute. These are our roots. This is where the first, you know, paranormal phenomena was captured on these things. You know, why get rid of this? Because, you know, yeah, we've moved to a digital age now and, and we don't need the media anymore. But I feel like we, we could still be missing out on things. There, there's a totally different process when it comes to recording with those devices. And is there phenomena that can be captured on film and on analog cassettes that can't be captured in the digital format? Yeah, uh, my books, I had not put out a Northwest guide for a long time now, but uh, you remember my first three sets of collected ghost stories on the Northwest, I always had a chapter, some thoughts on ghost hunting and talking about what was vogue at the time. Oh, yeah. It really did. Those first generation of digital cameras where people kept on coming up with orb photos, orb photos, and most of it was dust. Oh, yeah. And you still have that argument with people now because they still want to tell you that this orb is a ghost orb, not a dust orb. And, and the, the sad truth is we cannot tell the difference. You know, yeah, I believe in orbs. I've seen orbs with the naked eye. But, you know, I've realized you cannot post photos of orbs and, you know, maintain your credibility when people are becoming more educated and understanding the dust factor. And when you can't prove what's a real orb compared to what's a, a dust orb, you kind of have to, you know, put it to the side and say, well, you know, that was interesting, but I, I can't tell you that it wasn't dust. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, people will have this argument with you. I've, I've fought with people, ghost hunters, saying, well, I know what a dust orb looks like, or I know this this area was not dusty. You can't avoid dust. Dust is everywhere, you know? Yeah. And mixed in with that, again, as you and I kind of reminisce a little bit, the, the nice thing about a film camera is they are less prone to having problems with, say, dust and things like that in software errors. Let's face it, bad software, bad CMOS chips. When you're using something, piece of film and a glass lens, it's a lot, lot less easy to have false ghost images and things like that. Right, right. And I remember when you were teaching one of your classes, I had this one woman who, you, I know, I had a confrontation with her when you asked me to talk about uh, white noise, and and she wanted to talk about orb photos, and she was her argument was, but. But I'm going to continue using this camera because I'm getting stuff. I'm getting orbs. And I kept on trying to tell her that just because you're getting something doesn't mean you're getting the right thing. Exactly. And, yeah, she got upset. And I know she went to you, and I felt bad for you because you were now put in the middle. Like, Ross, you brought this guest guy in who told me I was a flake. Uh. <laughs> and, and it's hard. And it's one of those things that we still argue today in the community that people want that instant gratification and, and they want to believe that they're not wasting their time hanging out in a haunted place they want to get that you know that that proof positive that this is a ghost and and they can't you know understand that sometimes when you go ghost hunting you're not going to get anything yeah if it were that easy and i tell people at gatherings too if it were that easy uh, communication lines were that open there would be special columns in newspapers or special blogs messages from the other side uh, it's not that easy no, it's not. And I feel like it's only getting worse because younger generations are accepting what we see on TV as the norm. And that's the way it is. And there is this false reality when it comes to the television shows and even now books because just any anybody can write a book now and it's a lot of misleading information and a lot of mistakes that are constantly being published in it. and what we've learned is you know when people are constantly told this is right this is right you believe that that's right yes so if, if they're I, I, go, i'm sorry <laughs> no it's just you know that's one of the things that i really strive to do is is just to get people hopefully on the right track in the right mindset as to what it's really like out there. Right. And and I know you have written Ghostology 101, your own book, on, on ghost hunting techniques. And uh, that's available through your website, right? Yeah. But that's a little outdated, too. That, that was, oh, what, 10 years ago? <laughs> I need to do another one. I should go do Ghostology 201. But my, if you want some more updated information on ghost hunting, definitely uh, you can check out my one of my books, uh, My Haunted Journal, which is a book that teaches people that if they are living in a haunted location, 
how important journaling is and how to do your own investigation. So that, that would be a little more updated than Ghostology 101. Okay. And, and I applaud you for that journaling. And this is one of the things that when I talk to people about haunted houses, and I have talked to them for years, is the, the thing that really sticks out, even if it's a, a innocuous, non-threatening haunt. Uh, every morning they come down from the bedroom and they find out that the TV's been turned on or something like that, that, that people are frightened, even by small stuff. They feel out of control. One of the recommendations that I make is keep a journal. If, if nothing else, you are now reasserting self-control. And, right. And sometimes... Well, yeah, I was going to say, well, journaling, you know, the other thing that's really important about it is, is it shows a pattern to the activity as well. And, and one of the things that I, I've also learned is I, I teach a class on, you know, paranormal journaling is the fact that people don't seem to understand that there's a lot of problems with the human memory. And as we, you know, start to relive our experience, it, it alters in some way. Uh, as you tell your experience over and over to people, you learn to tell it better, more believable, and you forget details. And so it's not people's intent to deceive us or to lie to us about these experiences. And in, 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 in some way, you don't you, you learn to remove all doubt because you don't want people to think that you're crazy. You had this experience. And so I find that it's really important that people journal that information so it's raw and true to what actually happened. And another thing that's really important about that is people don't realize that after about three minutes... If you haven't written down your experience, you forget things. Your short-term memory will only hold on to about three minutes uh, for a little bit of information for about three minutes. And then other things start to fil filter in and you forget details. Yeah, so there, there's also, I'm sorry, there's also point of view. The point of view, if you have two or three people witnessing an incident, uh, it's important for them, if they are going to be journaling, to do that before they even talk to each other about it. Oh, yeah, that's true, too. Yeah. How many times do police get a dozen people watching a car wreck and the eyewitness accounts are, are very, very different depending on the physical point of view as well as uh, emotional state of the witnesses? Exactly, exactly. Definitely, I, I always encourage people to, to journal everything that they're experiencing. You know, it doesn't have to be just ghost phenomena. It could be checking out your own psychic ability. You know, when you feel that you might have these abilities journaling and when you find that you you seem to be more right about your predictions or feelings it'll help build that confidence and you can actually determine what's the difference between your own imagination and what's actually the feelings that you're picking up as well yeah yeah you're right there too looks like i'm talking to the right guy so if you were <laughs> if if I won't say if, when uh, your students come to you and say, Ross, what would you recommend as far as any kind of gizmos or equipment? What, what do you recommend? What's in the, the Ghost Hunters toolkit? Well, if you look at my case, it's thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment, but I don't expect everybody to spend, you know, that kind of money on equipment. It really determines on, on what you want to focus on. Always the tried and true equipment is going to be your camera, uh, I would definitely get a infrared camera or low light camera is going to be a really great one. Also, if you can, you know, video is going to be perfect because you want to have the recording from point A to point B in documenting your experience. Photos can only tell you so much. So video is always, it should always be number one whenever you're out there documenting the phenomena. Audio recorders are always going to be great. Because, again, if you want to try for EVP, electronic voice phenomena, you're going to want those as well. But also keep in mind that EVP can show up on video as well. So when you're reviewing your videos, listen for EVPs. And EMF detector is interesting, you know, a simple tool to have. Uh, going with most theories that some of these spirits can produce low levels of EMF. They can also manipulate the EMF readings as well. So that would be easily the basics mm -hmm. um, but again if you want to you know, go into thousands of dollars of equipment then you're, you're talking about ion counters and thermal cameras and all kinds of sonic devices and you know, I can't even <laughs> begin yeah. with the list you know light sensors and yeah yeah as a matter of fact I remember you used to use little motion detector alarms yeah and we still do 
so yeah, you, that's that's another simple device that you can add to your ghost hunting equipment. Um, those are pretty inexpensive, and there's various different types of motion sensors. You have to understand, you know, what kind of you know sensor you have. Some motion sensors will use temperature will spike a reading, or light will spike a reading. So even sometimes shadows, your own shadow can cause a motion sensor to go off. So you can get a lot of false readings as well, unless you understand the device that you're actually using. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. None of these gizmos themselves are are perfect none of these gizmos are real ghost detectors they are scientific devices designed for another purpose it is understanding right. how they work right and that and that's the thing is people will constantly come up to me and say oh i want to see your ghost meter and i have to remind them there's no such thing as a ghost meter there's no device out there that's going to tell you you have a ghost in your home the best that we can do as paranormal investigators is take all kinds of devices that help us to read the environment and determine if there's changes to the environment that we can't explain. That is the best that we can do. It's all trial and error in ghost hunting. In process of elimination, we eliminate the likely improbable and mundane, leaving us with anomalies. Right. Yeah. Makes me want to go get some gizmos and, and set up a vigil somewhere. But that's what you're doing all the time. I am. <laughs> so what, uh, if, if you don't mind talking your choice, the, the haunt that sticks out to you, the, the haunt that you're going to. Now, you run also your own ghost walk in Seattle. Anything you want to talk about, just go ahead. Well, gosh, there's a lot. <laughs> you just threw a lot out there for me. So let's, let's, let's go with the last one. Um, Spooked in Seattle, Ghost Tours. Uh, yeah, I, uh, we've actually are going, gosh, I think 14, 15 years now doing Spooked in Seattle Tours. We are based in Pioneer Square. Um, we've actually been uh, voted on numerous uh, media outlets as being one of the top ghost tours in America. And that's kind of shocking for me, you know, especially for Seattle. Seattle, you know, if you're not familiar with the, the history of Seattle, we're one of the youngest cities out there. The Northwest was the last part of the, the country to be developed. So to have a city that's so young being featured as one of the top ghost tours, a lot of people like to focus on history as part of their, their big part of their ghost tour it, it's amazing that even, yes, Seattle still had its fair share of shady and, and a, a wrongful history, but it's still amazing that we could still be considered compared to more of the more historic cities when you come across on the East Coast. So that, that was pretty cool. I know I'm losing my train of thought here. Okay, I'll pontificate a little bit then. Um, is I will actually disagree with you and, and suggest that you accept some praise. It's Seattle, I think the Seattleites were working overtime compressing a lot of crime and ghost making activity in the earliest days so even though Seattle's a younger city it sure had an active past but, oh yeah oh, but, definitely but even more important than that being voted the number one ghost walk uh, in the country or top five depending on who you talk to that is a tribute to the storytelling ability and the historic research that you and other people on your tour group have done can't can't separate the two a, a great tour is the guides and is their material and so that's all you guys Thank you. <laughs> it's still kind of shocking to me. I was like, oh, my God, really? This is amazing. But, yeah, 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 I, I agree with you. You know, there, there's been a lot of tours that I've taken all over uh, the world, and you, you kind of walk away going, really? You know, especially because even ghost tours have changed quite a bit, you know, since the popularity of ghost hunting. It, it seemed like a lot of ghost tours, their main focus was to scare people because, you know, this is a ghost tour, and it's supposed to be scary, and so a lot of these tours are, were very well known to make up stories or dramatize stories to build that chill factor. And, of course, what I really focused on and how I developed Spook in Seattle was the fact that I was taking those kind of tours. And being a ghost hunter myself, and I'd hear a really cool story, and I'd be like, oh, my God, i got to check this place out. And then I'd do my research, and I found out that that never happened at that place. I was really let down. And, and so I was just like, you know what, I'm going to do a ghost tour based off all the research that I had done in Seattle and a lot of these places that we had, had investigated. And 
I'm going to focus those stories and put those stories and evidence that we had collected and put that out there. And you know, I, I come to find out, you know, we were like the first one of the first ghost tours out there that was based off of the ghost hunter's viewpoint and sharing the evidence and, and stuff like that. So so that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And history to getting the history right. Uh, as you s- talked about, you find out that they invented the stories. That is it's almost like being lied to. And not only that, when the guides do that, people feel like they're paying money to be lied to. Right, and and that's what I mean. You know that, that ghost hunt or ghost tours had changed just within the last twenty years as well, and, and that's where you know people were more focused on just the the fake stories and the scare factor. Most ghost tours were being run, you know, around Halloween, and now you know ghost tours can run all year round. Just like my tour, you know, it runs all year round. And then of course, one of the things that I've always told people at the end of my tour. It's, yeah, you know, a lot of these tours were meant to scare people and they'd make up the stories to scare you. But I find that the scariest stories are the real ones. And that's what I focus on. But yeah, you'll still find a lot of tours out there and I still come across them where they still will dramatize the stories or make up the stories. And, and it's still a little frustrating because, you know, when you I take ghost tours for the research to look into places for hopefully future investigations and it is kind of upsetting when you 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 pay this money to hear about what's happening in some of these places and you find out they've totally made it up and it's like damn it <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and the thing i also like about your tour is it doesn't just end or begin on the street you and i have both attended some of these ghost walks or in london the various jack the ripper walks where somebody's holding up a homemade cardboard sign that says jack the ripper or ghost walk you actually have a storefront oh yeah yeah we actually have a uh, a place that includes the seattle underground in pioneer square uh the heart of seattle where the most historic part of seattle Another thing, just to, to kind of to bitch a little bit here, I always hated taking those ghost tours where they'll stand at the corner of the block and they'll point down the street and say, oh, just a block down the street, there's a house, and they'll tell you a story about that house. Uh-huh. I'm like, uh, why don't you just take us the extra block to show us the house? <laughs> yeah, that's so true. It's all lazy tour guiding, you know? They don't want to walk the extra block to, to, to take you in front of these places that they want to talk about, or they'll talk about something that doesn't even have to do with the area just to have a filler in the tour yeah that's true uh and sometimes you get inexperienced new guides who take out the three by five card and read it verbatim Uh, yeah (laughs) death death of the tour guide right there yes yes yeah now if i recall your uh your storefront is in the basement of the rivoli restaurant right or did uh, I get that wrong? You got that wrong. Okay. Denuncios. Denuncios, okay. Yeah. And I remember when you were setting up and going down with you, and and you have vision. I, I, I have the capability of vision, too. But in this particular case, we're, we're down in the basement. You were so enthused. You said, Jeff, come and see, come and see. And you saw all of the possibilities of something. I saw two big, huge rooms with a whole bunch of kind of mildewy smell. <laughs> <laughs> and so what have you done with that space now? Now we are the first death museum in the Northwest. We actually uh, feature uh, vintage coffins, morning attire, morning jewelry, all kinds of you know morbid, macabre type of stuff down there. We also have haunted uh, haunted collections, so we have haunted dolls and toys and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it's huge. And plus, we have a section of the underground down there that we take people into in the dark during the tours. We have a gift shop as well, and we have a nice, you know, big meeting space where we'll actually, you know, tell stories or we'll host events down there as well. Like this uh, Christmas, we did Christmas with Krampus. Um, yeah, Any children so beaten with sticks? We have children beat with sticks. We go the whole hundred yards on that. <laughs> <laughs> but then also, I have my a ghost, the Advanced Ghost Hunters in Seattle, Tacoma. We have our lab down there, so we basically uh, do all of our you know research. We have a library, 
and can do any video editing we need to do all down there and audio, all that. So it, it's pretty sweet. Now, how long do the uh, the tours normally last? It depends on the tour. Uh-huh. We do all kinds of different tours. Uh, we have our basic ghost tour, which is about 90 minutes, and that'll take you throughout Pioneer Square, sharing uh, some of the most haunted places. We are also one of the only tours that will actually take you inside a lot of the places, especially like Merchant's Cafe that was featured on The Dead Files twice and another show called When Ghosts Attack. We'll also take you into the underground as well. Then we also have Deluxe Tour, which will take you into an extra section of the underground. Then we also have a Haunted Pub Tour, which will take you through Pioneer Square's area as well to some of the most haunted pubs. And we tell more of the shadier stories of Seattle that are adult-themed. And then we have a How to Murder Tour, which talks about some of the most notorious murder cases that have taken place in the Seattle area. And then we do ghost hunts as well. We'll take you ghost hunting to a few places, not only just in the Seattle area, Pioneer Square area, but we'll do one at University Heights, which is an old elementary school. We do one at the USS Turner Joy in Bremerton, an old uh, Navy destroyer that's been retired. And we take you there, and sometimes we even do overnights where you spend the night on the ship. So lots and lots of fun stuff going on there. Well, good. Thank you for sharing about that. And the reason I specifically wanted to draw you out is this podcast is going to be listened to on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And so there are a lot of European folk, English, as well as I think we have people tuning in from uh, other parts of Europe. So these are some great vacation ideas. And, And I'm not just saying that to you and to the listeners for some kind of a some recompense ross does not pay me a dime for this although he should (laughs) i should (laughs) but uh yeah (laughs) well i still have a couple of tickets that you gave me for an event i just haven't been up to seattle recently to go and experience all these new tours and new activities that you're promoting well, we do all, yeah, a lot of stuff, even events. We do celebrity ghost hunts where we bring in some of the big names and we'll do a ghost hunt with them. So, and I tried to get you. You, you one did. Of those. You did, you absolutely. Come up for that. Yep, you did. I, I, well, that was uh, year 2014, 2015. Not a, not a good time in my life. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, no, not. Yes, Ross, it's your fault. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I get blamed for everything. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, this. But that, you know, invitation's still out there if you ever want to come up to Seattle and do one of those events. You're more than welcome to. Well, thanks. And I won't just drop in. I'll call, call and coordinate in advance, especially if you happen to be on the road filming your TV show. Oh, yeah. That was a lead in if you couldn't tell. No, no, no. I can't talk too much about that right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, as much as I want to. Well, uh, w- when and, you yeah. can, let me know. Will you come back on as a guest? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's now we're we're finalizing a few things, and uh, it's exciting. It really is because this is something that I created, and so it's it's going to be very unique, very controversial, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm something that I don't want to do these cookie cutter ghost hunting shows that are out there. There are a dime a dozen now. In fact, I've just been told that there's like ten more ghost hunting shows that are going to come out just this next season. And it's just ridiculous, you know, some of these shows and even some of the people that are going to be on these shows. It's like, what? That's my frustration. And that's another thing that me and David Weatherly were talking about, you know, the the big changes in this field. Is this like back in the day, you were more looked as to a leader in the field if you were publishing books. Like you, Jeff. You Mm -hmm. know, I reached out to you when I started my group because you were out there. You were publishing the books. You were doing the research. And so that's, you know, how we met. And then now it's like anybody can publish a book and you don't have to have any history or anything like that in the field. But now it seems like most people look to you as being a more credible investigator if you have a television series. People don't seem to realize that most of these people in the field of paranormal research have never done anything in the, par- in the world of paranormal research prior to any of these ghost hunting shows. You know, mm-hmm. and it's it's it, it's sad. It really is sad that, and, and I get back to what we were talking about in the beginning. It, the reality of it is, is it's not really reality. Some of them not. I agree, and 
uh, I think you and I have talked about this. We talk about a lot of different things when we get together. And uh, one of my other guests was Jeff Belanger, who is the principal researcher for uh, Ghost Adventures. He came up through, through the ranks, to use the arm expression like you and I did. He started off doing his own research and it was through his through his books. He wrote Weird Massachusetts, among other books, that he got hired on as a researcher. And when we talked about it, and you know this too, you're, you're working and building one of these shows. When you do your investigation, you end up with 40, 50 hours of video and audio footage that was your investigation. And you have to compress that into a 42 minute show which also includes act breaks and in teasers uh sometimes the editing process gets it very very wrong oh yeah oh yeah but it's not only just that though it's just the the talent that they bring into these you know shows a lot of the people don't seem to understand that most of the talent they get from are from casting calls yeah well, they'll put out a casting call to all these message boards where people who are striving to be actors you know, and get their 15 minutes of fame and then they'll say oh we're just looking for somebody interested in the paranormal and they'll be like oh yeah I'm interested in the paranormal I watched all the episodes of Ghost Hunters you know <laughs> and the next thing you know they're a professional ghost hunter on a television series because they had the personality that's what they look for a lot of these shows you know yeah you and I sat on a panel with somebody who I, I will not name don't don't you name him either and th that was one of the things he talked about was they had a theme for the show and he studied up on it studied up on a certain profession and one of the reasons he got hired was because he talked the lingo even though he'd never actually done it done the job himself before right so yeah right. And, and that's the way it is you know, none of these, you know, producers will do the research to find out if this person is even legit. You, they'll sit there and they can lie their their pants off and say, oh, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. And, the, and yet there's nothing to back it up. You can look me up. You can find media that goes back to, you know, 2000. You know, I was on a, a documentary on, on ghost hunting back in 2003, I think it was, before the Ghost Hunters even aired and, and started all this. And, of course, you, Jeff, you've got books that go way back, too. Yeah. Well, my first so, TV appearance was on uh, Haunted History. I think it aired history. in 2001. Yeah, yeah. So, granted, we have the history in this field, even before the popularity of ghost hunting, when we still had to be in the closet because no one would want to talk to ghost hunters. <laughs> <laughs> So it's just surprising how much it's changed. And I'm, I'm sorry if this is not how you wanted your show to go. <laughs> what? Between you and me right here? No, this is your, your guy with something to say. Uh, I'm just sitting here recording it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. you're more than welcome to bitch too, Jeff. Come on. <laughs> well, no. I tend to save those for certain other times. Okay. Usually when I got... I'm holding my glass up on high and, and gesturing with it, and all the contents are slopping off on everybody. <laughs> That's when I rant. But, no, nah, I'm glad that you're here and you can talk about this uh, from your experience because that is one of the things uh, that I've told you live and by emails, too, is, is I know that you really wanted your own show, and that is what you've been devoted to, is, is getting your show, not just somebody else's show. And so congratulations. Well, thank you. It's still uh, early in the process. It's the next big step. And it's like, you know, I didn't get into this field to, to, to have a television show. That was not my focus. And, it, and believe me, I have been offered television shows in the past and I've turned them down because that's, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I wanted to get away from the problems that we have when it comes to the media outlook on ghost hunting. If I was going to do a show, I want to do a show that's about the education in the field because the biggest thing is is it's become monkey see, monkey do. So whatever people see on TV, they imitate it in life, and they don't realize that even some of the stuff that you see on TV is done completely wrong. And so I really wanted to do something that if I was going to do a show – that that stood out that was that was unique that was not just this you know let's just send a bunch of people into a haunted place and, and also really focuses on the research and it was hard 
finding a production company that that saw the value in that because most of these people want to focus on the scream factor the fear factor in fact there's a whole new batch of shows coming out they're going to focus on demons uh, that's going to be the main focus demons and monsters yeah and you know? and i know some people who have haunted houses haunted locations that for various reasons are actually kind of proud like i live in a haunted house and this is really cool because the ghost is so and so and this is why they're sticking around you're kind of living in history if you live in a haunted house or work in a haunted business but they are afraid of saying it too loudly because you bring in some of the tv shows not all some of the tv shows just like you're saying it's all about demons right and it can destroy your life or your business it can and and that's going back to the beginning of all this that was one of the the biggest problems that i found in this field being that there's so many groups out there you can go into we you know we get called in for investigations you know all the time and you'll find a situation where a client will call you in and say, you know, I think I have something going on. And you'll do your job and you may actually debunk what they're experiencing and say, oh, well, I don't think it's a ghost. It's very well this, this and this. And if they're truly believing it's, it's a ghost, they're just not going to believe you as a researcher. They'll say, oh, no, no, no. It's definitely a ghost. It can't be that. I know it's not that. Well, OK, you know, I I, 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 I think could be wrong, but. Mm -hmm. They'll go out and get a second opinion from another group that will tell them, yes, it's a ghost or yes, it's demons. And and that's where we lose touch with reality and it it gets to be a problem. There's been situations where we've had to defuse situations because a group got in before us and scared the clients to death to the point where they were about ready to sell their home and put themselves in financial debt because the group told them that it was all demons and it was out to get them and and kill them and they needed to get out you know just to save their lives and you get in there and it's nothing like that and you really have to talk them off the ledge and say hey here's what's going on and you've done them a huge service there's been quite a few clients that are like praised us oh my god thank you for doing that we were so scared and now we realize it's not what the other group said it was Mm -hmm. This gets back to establishing control, -control, self-control, control of your environment. Mm -hmm. So, tirade done? (laughs) Oh, I could go on forever. That's that's why I was doing the show, The Angry Ghost Hunter Show. Because of all these issues that we have in the paranormal field. It's like, oh my God. (laughs) Okay, Uh, now where were we? Oh, I was going to change the subject a little bit because I think a lot of the people in the audience would be curious about maybe your top 10 public haunted locations that you would recommend for the the casual recreational ghost hunter to go visit, even the top five. Oh, no, I I think I could do, let's see, top 10 ghost hunts. Let me think here. Um... There's so many. The one thing that that I love about my job is having the opportunity to travel all over the world investigating some of these places. And I've actually done quite a few trips out to Europe. So, and in fact, you you you're very much aware of that as well. Um So, let me think here. My top 10 ghost hunts. I want to spread it out here, especially for people that do love to travel. So I want to make sure I uh, cover a a wide area here. So let's start with um, in the UK, one of my favorite places to investigate uh, where I had a very interesting experience was the Ancient Ram's Inn. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty amazing place. We were up in the attic space and we asked for something to please, you know, knock to give us a sign that you're there. And all of a sudden, right above our heads, there was this three loud bangs. We literally had to run out of the building and look to see if there was anything on the roof. Yeah. Now, where is that at? York or London? That is uh, outside of London. Okay. I forget the name of the the village that it's in, but yeah, it's called the Ancient Ram's Inn. Oh, okay. That's an amazing place. And that's actually probably one of the most featured places, you know, out there as being one of the top places to investigate. But being a ghost hunting group in the Northwest here in the States, it was actually a pretty amazing experience to have that opportunity to investigate 
a place like that. Lots of history there. And I hear that that place actually is running into some trouble. There's been talk. I don't know if it's true or not, but there's been talk that they're actually might be tearing it down. Hmm. And I was there. You know, that place is pretty run down, but it's been years since I've been there. I'd say another good one would be Alcatraz Prison. We were one of the first ghost hunting groups to actually visit Alcatraz for a ghost hunt and spend the night. So that was a lot of fun. In fact, Alcatraz was where I had my first physical experience where um, I was actually in the morgue area. These were areas that weren't open to the public back then. I think they are now, they've opened up quite more, a lot more to the, to, sorry. They've opened a lot more at the prison for the public now. So I actually was in some of the places that you can actually visit now, but you couldn't back then. And the morgue was one of them. And it was kind of cool because if you're not familiar with Alcatraz's history, it started out as a military base, then it was a military prison, and then it became the state penitentiary. But I actually went into the morgue area, and there's this tunnel that you go down, and it takes you down into the underground because in the underground portion, they used to keep the gunpowder down there to keep it cool. But they also kept the bodies down there. So I ventured down there, and it's nothing but a dirt floor, brick walls, and ceiling. So I take a picture. Okay, that's cool. I want to now take a picture of the entrance. So at this time, members were filtering in behind me. So I start to back up to take a picture of the entrance. And as I'm backing up, somebody put their hand on my shoulder and physically stopped me. And so I turned to apologize to the member that I had backed into the corner, and there was nobody behind me. And I physically felt the pressure of fingers, the weight of a man's hand. And again, it physically stopped me as I was stepping backwards. And again, nobody there. That is so cool. You're so lucky, Ross. (laughs) If you're ever in the Seattle area, definitely check out the USS Turner Joy. That's just a quick ferry ride from Seattle into Bremerton. And that's a a public museum that you can actually visit. And there's uh, quite a few ghost stories there that take place. Gotten some amazing EVPs at that location. One of my favorite EVPs is when me and my team member were alone investigating the refrigeration area. And we actually wore naval uniforms because we were using this as a trigger. And he actually is in the Navy. And so he was wearing his whites. And he's telling me, as we're down there uh, videotaping, he's telling me that he normally doesn't have to wear his whites for more than, like, three hours. Little did we know that during that conversation, there's sounds of a fight breaking out, and a guy yells, butt-kicking. And so this was captured on EVP. So we submitted that EVP to the director of the ship, and he sat on this for years. And out of the blue, he calls me up. And he tells me something interesting happened. Now, every so often, some of the men that actually served on the ship will visit. And whenever these guys come back, the, um, the team likes to meet with these guys and kind of get some stories of what life was like living on the Turner Joy. Well, one guy was taking you know, the director around, telling him some stories, and he takes him down into that refrigeration area. And he says, boy, I have a, te- a story to tell you. He says that when he was serving, that there was this little cook and this big cook. And this big guy constantly picked on that little guy. And one day when they were down there, that big guy started picking on him again. And that little guy just snapped. And he just started pounding on that big guy. And that sailor said that was the biggest butt kicking I had ever seen. And it was, it was surprising because he used the word butt kicking. Now, most sailors, you know, they have the dirtiest mouths. So for him to say butt kicking, it triggered the EVP that we had actually captured there where it, it sounds like a guy yelling butt kicking. And so we think we captured that residual energy of that event that took place there, that fight. Cool. Yeah. Now, of course, if you are in the Seattle area, you definitely want to check out Booked in Seattle. Um, mm-hmm. We got a section of the underground. We just got back from Rome where we spent three weeks out in Sicily, Rome and Sicily. So that was a lot of fun. We did a, a castle out there and it had some pretty cool experiences in some of the catacombs. I mean, there's lots of stories of the catacombs being haunted. In fact, one of my favorite EVPs that I captured in the catacombs is I was down there by myself. Um, this is one of the times when I went to Rome by myself and I had actually set up a, um, a, an investigation 
And so they locked me in a small section of the catacombs because if you're familiar with the catacombs, they're, they're massive, all right? People have been lost down there for days. So they locked me in this small section of the catacombs so I wouldn't wander off and get lost. And I have to admit, I don't speak Italian. So mm-hmm. I'm doing the best that I can to communicate in another country. And I'm walking around these catacombs and I ask, is there somebody here? And little did I know when I played back my recording, I actually captured an EVP that says C. Which, which of is, course, Italian for yes. Yeah. So that was pretty amazing because I always thought it was kind of interesting that whenever these ghost hunting shows go to foreign countries, they always seem to capture EVPs in English when English is not their main language. Yeah, I I wondered about that too. Yeah, so it just goes to prove that, yes, you can capture EVPs in other languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've only got a couple more minutes, Ross. Any final thoughts, anything we haven't talked about yet? Well, we talked about a lot of stuff. Um, I'm hoping I gave you what you were looking for, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think. You know, it's there's a lot to talk about when it comes to the paranormal field. My main thing is I'm always trying to get out there and educate people when it comes to ghost hunting. You know, that's why I teach the classes. That's why I do the lectures. If anybody wants to learn more about what's going on out there, you know, some of the best equipment, always feel free to, to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to share those stories. For anybody to get in touch with you, what's the best way, Ross? Well, the best way, I'm really very active on my Facebook page. So if you are on Facebook, definitely uh, look up Ross Allison Ghost Hunter and follow me. Unfortunately, I can't take any more friends because I'm at my max. But uh, always follow me because throughout my travels, I do a lot of live investigations from Facebook. So you can definitely uh, see those as well. So it's European fans might be able to catch up with you and take you to some special places. Oh, yeah, definitely. So I've got that. Uh, you can always check out our website at a ghost, A-G-H-O-S-T dot org. You can see uh, some of the stuff that we've been doing and we've done, and uh, we do a pretty good job trying to keep that up to date. Even some of our evidence, we're trying to get all that that up there as well. Does, uh, does a ghost still have open membership, or have you closed the membership? No, we still have open membership. I will never stop doing that. I, I would never want to see anybody that has passion in this field uh, slip through the cracks and not be able to find the right outlets to, to get involved. Great. Any any other things, favorite? Well, we've got maybe well, one or two minutes left. Go. Definitely you can check out my books. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, a handful of books out there from uh, Ghostology 101, if you want to learn some of the earlier basics in ghost hunting, um, there's also Spooked in Seattle. Uh, there's Tacoma's Haunted History. And then there's My Haunted Journal. And, of course, Haunted uh, Toys and Haunted Ships and Lighthouses, which are the first two in the series that me and David Weatherly are writing right now. Uh, we have a couple more coming out this year. So, you know, definitely watch for those as well. And if you're in the Seattle area, check out Spooked in Seattle. And you can check out our website at spooked in i n seattle uh, dot com, and we got all kinds of fun events going on there as well. Okay, great. And uh, as general reference for people listening, I'm going to start giving my web address because uh, so far on my website, which is one word ghostsandcritters.com in the what's new section I usually post some kind of a notice about the podcast and links so I will try and have some links and a little bit larger write up on what Ross does for you to begin your own investigation and so Ross I know you've got to go because you're a busy guy I thank you so much for your time oh anytime Jeff okay and uh, if nothing else I'll see you at the upcoming Oregon Ghost Conference Sounds great. All right. You take care. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. Our theme music has been Dance Macabre by Camille Sancien performed by Kevin McLeod, www.incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0.
Thank you for listening to The Peculiar World here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. <laughs>